Awesome. Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to give everyone just a second to trickle into the room and then we'll we'll get started. Okay, awesome. I think folks are still trickling in, but I think we can go ahead and jump in. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Jonathan, Climate Draft, Tara, MCJ, um, Work on Climate for, for hosting this week. Uh, it's, it's really energizing to be here this morning. And Ryan and I are very much looking forward to the main event of the hour, which is showcasing a few carbon removal companies and the very cool founders behind them. Uh, but before we hand off to Lara, Marty, Olya, Brad, we want to take a second to introduce ourselves and also uh, the topic of carbon removal more broadly. I'm Joanna. I lead carbon removal procurement and ecosystem strategy at Stripe Climate and Frontier. Frontier is an advanced market commitment from Stripe, Alphabet, Shopify, Meta, and McKinsey to basically spend 925 million buying durable carbon removal over the next decade. We work with a large scientific advisory to review and select early stage projects that, that meet our criteria and then help facilitate purchases on behalf of frontier buyers. So my perspective here on the field is primarily as an, an early and often first purchaser of, of carbon removal and You'll hear today from a few of the founders that we've been lucky enough to purchase carbon removal from. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Orbuck, a partner at Lower Carbon Capital. Uh, I lead our $350 million carbon removal fund, which we launched uh, early last year. In practice, we're an early stage venture fund in investing across emissions reduction, carbon removal, and solutions that sort of help humanity adapt or buy more time to address the impacts of climate change. We've had a chance to work with uh, dozens of carbon removal founders, including a number of the folks uh, you'll meet today. And we basically want to serve to help get supply of carbon removal ready to go so that when Frontier or anyone else uh, is out there buying, there's actually great solutions uh, run by great founders uh, that can scale to meet the, the level of carbon removal that, we're, that we'll need. So really excited for you to meet uh, a lot of these folks today. And carbon removal is a fun place to work. Hopefully you'll consider it. Awesome. So before we get there, um, maybe a little bit of primer. This group on the call probably has heard a number of times this week that to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we have to limit warming to 1.5 degrees and we need to get global emissions down to net zero by about 2050 and about halfway there by 2030. So broadly, this means doing two things. Uh, the first, dramatically reduce emissions. And I know you've heard a ton of cool folks this week on that front. But the second is we need to permanently remove huge amounts of CO2 that are already in the atmosphere and the ocean on the order of gigatons per year. Both are a really big challenge, but we're kind of particularly far behind on that second on carbon removal. We have a number of temporary carbon removal solutions today. So afforestation, planting trees, but it's unlikely that these solutions alone will get us all the way there, in part because we'll, we'll run out of, of arable land. And durable carbon removal is kind of an important component of a, the broader suite of climate solutions for a number of reasons. So it allows us to address any long tail emissions from the really hard to decarbonize sectors of the economy. So think heavy industrials, aviation. It, uh, you know, we also have non-CO2 GHGs that contribute to warming. So methane with atmospheric concentrations that make removal more difficult. And so that also lets us counterbalance the warming there as well. And then removal also lets us bring temperatures back down if we are slow to reduce emissions or slower than we think, and we overshoot our climate target. 
So I've highlighted a bit the role that carbon removal can play in fighting climate change, but we also want to share for a moment kind of how we think about carbon removal in relation to the broader offset market that we hear about. So to be defined as carbon removal, a method has to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and then durably store it. So CCS, uh, which is capturing CO2 from a fossil fuel plant and storing it, doesn't qualify. And similarly, removal is distinct from offsetting. Um, emitting a ton in, in one place and avoiding one elsewhere, or utilization, you know, capturing CO2, using it in ways that it's re-released, both don't, don't qualify as carbon removal. Um, and I would also say that both offsets and utilization have large existing supply in markets today. But if we take a look at carbon removal, it's a bit of a different story. So to give you a sense of where we are, this giant square represents the about 4 billion tons of CO2 that we need to permanently remove every single year by 2050. To date, we've durably removed less than 10,000 tons cum cumulatively. And the solutions that do exist, that tiny, tiny orange pixel, are primarily early stage and as a result, often really expensive. So think, you know, anywhere from 500 to $2,000 a ton today. And so to get carbon removal to this giant brown square and this order of magnitude requires a lot of innovation, a lot of R&D, a lot of philanthropic acceleration, raw materials, permitting, investment, government incentives, and more buyers who are willing to pay those early prices. So in short, we have we have a lot to get done. And I think Ryan and I, and probably a lot on this call would say that that makes this uh, a particularly exciting time to be to be in the field. Yes, yeah, so th thanks so much, Joanna. To set a little more context, the last two years in 2022 especially has really been a, a massive trajectory shift for carbon removal. It went from a sort of theoretical thing that was mentioned in a couple papers to in 2018, the IPCC indicating that it was absolutely necessary to meet a 1.5 degree uh, temperature target. And in 2022, we started to see the actual sort of industrial sector move into action to lay the groundwork for carbon removal to happen. And that's across demand, early investment and government support. These numbers are pretty hand wavy, but, but definitely directionally right. We went from you know tens of millions of dollars spent on high durability carbon removal uh, cumulatively prior to Frontier's announcement last year, and now well over a billion dollars has been committed through Frontier and other vehicles. Uh, in terms of early investment, uh, we've seen uh, rounds in the tens to high tens to hundreds of millions of dollars for companies like Heirloom and Climeworks, as well as uh, other sort of very promising early stage carbon removal companies. And from a very small amount of VC funding to dedicated carbon removal funds, uh, as well as other vehicles. And particularly excitingly, we've seen a massive inflection in government support, both from the Inflation Reduction Act, which is not even included on this slide, and also from the three and a half billion dollar uh, direct air capture hubs that the Department of Energy is now developing. The Inflation Reduction Act includes things like uh, very significant, you know, up to $180 a ton tax credits for carbon storage permanently in geologic formations, as well as a number of other credits and incentives for carbon removal initiatives. So it's finally the case that a founder building a carbon removal thing has a real market to sell into. Um, and because that market's developed, we've seen significant increases in investment. Uh, this is a number of different uh, sort of carbon sector uh, companies' investment data. You'll note the, the bar on the bottom, uh, the darkest red is carbon removal going from, you know, incredibly small in the 2020, in 2020 and 2021 to, you know, in the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars last year. So very excited to see it continue to grow. Um, yeah, carbon removal approaches are really a massive range of different things. You'll hear from a number of them today, but basically if, if you think about the sort of like carbon cycle map that you saw in your like high school or science textbook or whatever, any of the lines and any of the boxes, you can basically poke and move the carbon around. So we have everything from giant fans uh, like this Climeworks facility in Iceland that suck the CO2 out of the air, filter it and inject it into subsurface geologic formations. Uh, companies like Running Tide, you'll hear from Marty shortly, uh, are growing kelp in the middle of the ocean and sinking it. 
Um, and that's just a few of the things uh, out there. Uh, Charm, you may have seen uh, Peter Reinhardt from Charm speak earlier this week at Climate Draft. Uh, this is Sean, Charm's chief scientist, uh, pouring some bio oil into a little vial. They take uh, plant material, uh, turn it into bio oil, put the bio oil back underground, basically turning plants into oil and storing that permanently. Um, and yeah, sort of as we've mentioned, this is this is the decade to figure out what of this massive array of approaches at varying technology levels of readiness. Some stuff is research, some stuff has already been deployed at, at fairly meaningful scale, some stuff is sort of lab scale or benchtop scale today. Uh, this is the time where we're going to figure out what works. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars are being deployed in venture this year to early stage companies, hundreds of millions of dollars of, of large scale offtake agreements will be occurring this year. And uh, the founders who are getting started now are going to be the ones to figure out if we can actually do meaningful amounts of carbon removal. Um, we have four uh, awesome founders today across really quite a big range. Uh, I'll give a brief intro on each of them. First up is, is Dr. Laura Lammers from Travertine, followed by Marty, Olya, and Brad. Uh, Laura, over to you to share more about what you're working on at Travertine. Cool, thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here and excited that um, folks on this webinar are interested in, in joining this industry and joining this fight uh, to stabilize the climate. So um, Travertine is a, a, a startup company that I founded uh, basically a year ago, a couple of days ago, so it's one year old. Um, and what we're doing is using wastes from uh, the mining and fertilizer industries to remove carbon dioxide from the air and permanently sequester it by forming solid carbonate minerals. Um, and in addition to forming solid carbonates, we produce, we co-produce a number of additional products that are used in extractive industry and also can be used as, as fuels like hydrogen. Um, and so our goal at Travertine is to accelerate the natural processes that regulate CO2 in the atmosphere over geologic timescales, while at the same time um, eliminating major industrial waste streams. And so we hope that our process will have environmental co-benefits in addition to permanent carbon dioxide removal, but at the end of the day, um, the employees are here because they want to do uh, large-scale carbon dioxide removal and sequestration that's permanent. Um, and so the way that I got into this was uh, through rocks and minerals. So I've always been kind of a, a mineral geek. Uh, as a kid, I had a rock collection. Um, I grew up in Texas in, in oil and gas uh, heavy town and uh, was always aware of, of climate change and the impacts of fossil fuels on on climate. Um, and so, uh, and at the same time, I was interested in kind of earth sciences. And so I kind of took those interests together and I did a lot of work in um, contaminant um, transport and remediation, understanding how natural materials regulate um, uh, environmental contaminants in water and soils. Um, when I went and did my PhD, it turned out that I ended up in the group of Don DePaulo at UC Berkeley. And he was leading at the time uh, an, one of the first research consortia on subsurface geologic carbon dioxide sequestration. And so uh, we've been putting CO2 underground for decades, since the 70s, and enhanced oil and gas extraction. Um, but we haven't been doing it deliberately for a long time to remove CO2 from the atmosphere and sequester it permanently. And so um, the, the point of that research consortium was to basically understand the, the fate and the mechanisms of transformations of CO2 in the subsurface and would it permanently be there and, and what forms would it take? And so that set me on this path towards carbonate mineralization. That was great for me because I got to start learning at a very fundamental level how minerals actually grow. Um, and stepping back, the earth has a natural weathering cycle where CO2 basically chemically reacts with rocks like this rock uh, and it turns into a solid carbonate mineral. But that cycle operates at about a billion tons of CO2 per year, which is not fast enough relative to the emissions that we're making. Um, and so I got really into carbonate mineralization and I've been working on that for the balance of my career. So um, I've been uh, for the last several years at UC Berkeley as an assistant professor in the environmental science department. Um, and that was wonderful. I got to do a lot of uh, really fun fundamental research on carbonate mineralization and selective extraction of critical resources. Um, but I've always struggled with this tension between fundamental science and uh, application, because a lot of times in academia, the fundamental breakthroughs and the break basic science revelations are rewarded more than or valued more than kind of application. And so um, last January, I took the kind of difficult, um, made the difficult choice to leave my, my job at Cal and um, started this company, Travertine, and I've been here. 
uh, the last year and it's been amazing and, and super fun and I don't regret it uh, for a minute now, but I do, I'm really glad that I went through academia. So anyway, so um, as far as the, the space, so we have a couple of questions here that were prompts from um, Ryan and Joanna. Um, so carbon removal, I think it's a really, really exciting industry to get in because it basically, as Ryan described very uh, clearly, appeared overnight, right? It's the past two years have really um, seen true investment into carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. So there have been folks in geochemistry and biogeochemistry have been working on kind of laying the scientific uh, groundwork for this for long periods of time, uh, but there hasn't been a way to actually translate that fundamental knowledge into real world application. And that's mostly because there hasn't been a value Price, uh, priced on essentially the, the downside, the env environmental downside of emitting carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, right? Um, so now that we're all really acutely feeling the impacts of the climate crisis, we've all experienced weather events that, um, that are attributable to climate change, um, the mood's really shifted. And so now actually commercializing solutions and taking these fundamental insights from the lab into real world application has become viable. So it's not really, I don't believe a question of uh, technological capability. So the, the technologies or the basic science behind the technologies are there. Now the challenge is really in scaling. It's taking those insights and ma making something that will sequester CO2 uh, at extremely large scales, right? On par with the orders of magnitude of, of the natural weathering cycle, right? And so um, it's, it's a daunting and exciting challenge, but it's, I, I think it's, it's definitely feasible in the sense that humans already move um, and process materials at these orders of magnitude today, right? Fossil fuels being a great case in point. Um, and so as an organization, Travertine uh, is, we're quite new. So again, we're a year old. We now have um, eight uh, full-time employees, which is very exciting and we're growing quickly. Um, we're working on an engineered carbon dioxide removal solution, which is kind of integrating with extractive processes for fertilizer production um, and mining critical elements like lithium and nickel, for, which are gonna be essential for electrifying uh, the grid. And so um, we are uh, basically gonna be building large scale chemical plants and, and doing this to replace conventional processes for producing some of these materials in a way that will sequester CO2 and also minimize waste. Um, and so where we are today is we have a facility here in, in Colorado. Uh, we've got an office, obviously, and then a lab as well as a warehouse facility. So the lab, we're, we're still doing some R&D optimization. Um, in the warehouse, we're building our bigger scale system and operating basically a miniaturized plant. Um, and then using all that knowledge to engineer our first infield pilot. So right now we are um, basically working hard on engineering design for our first thousand ton per year CO2 removal pilot. And so again, that seems like a small scale, but um, if, if I think about going from my first experiments on the lab bench to that first infield pilot, which will happen over a period of three years, that's six orders of magnitude in scale, right? And so if that can happen in three years, I think we can get a couple more orders of magnitude over the next decade or two, right? So I'm really optimistic. Um, as far as where uh, folks coming from the tech industry can contribute, there are a million ways. And I think um, we should rely on you to take your creativity and understanding of your personal interests, um, the things you're passionate about, and try to find the right fit with, with the industry. Um, personally, with Travertine, we have loads of data we're sitting on. You know, we love machine learning um, and optimization of the system and processes. Um, we'd love uh, site planning and selection that's uh, that based on data. We'd love feedstock assessment and analysis. Um, and so basically, I think folks from data science will have major contributions and you know we'd, we'd love to find fits for them, the travertine over the um, next several years. Um, and again, you know, I think a, a big part of this is just, finding um, the fit between your personal passions and uh, industry needs. And um, as, as we post jobs at Travertine, we, you know, we get great candidates, but um, sometimes it's the candidates whose skills actually don't fit perfectly with the job that are bringing something to the table we didn't expect um, or didn't even think about needing, but then realized we would really need um, who, who get our attention. And so I would say, don't be shy about applying to a position that doesn't appear to be exactly the perfect fit. Um, for, for your skill set. So um, that's all I have to say. So thanks for giving me the opportunity.
Thank you so much, Laura. And also, if you go work at Fabricane, you get to live in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, which is hard to beat. Um, uh, thank you, Laura. Um, up next, we have we have Marty, uh, CEO of Running Tide. Just for context, uh, each of these folks will be sharing a, a few minutes on their carbon removal approach, but also sort of their background, how they ended up in this field. None of these people really expected to be working on carbon removal, and they all have pretty fascinating backgrounds and, and paths into the space. Um, and at the end, we'll have 10 minutes or so for the questions that are bubbling up in the chat um, and a good way for you to follow up with, with everyone uh, that you've heard from today. So uh, over to you, Marty. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, I'm a... so I run Running Tide. Running Tide is uh, builds the tools, techniques, and infrastructure to scale up ocean carbon removal through, you know, uh, a ver... we have a multi-pathway approach um, to carbon removal. So uh, growing macroalgae, uh, increasing alkalinity through dissolution of, uh, you know, different mineral materials, and then uh, terrestrial biomass sinking as part of a single supply chain that we're building up. Uh, how did I get into the space? Long story. <laughs> um, I uh, grew up in a commercial fishing family and kind of was raised in that industry. Um, got to spend a lot of time uh, on boats. Um, and was totally obsessed from an early age at the engineering aspects of it. So that became kind of my, my, my way to contribute to the kind of family business was just, uh, was being an engineer and, uh, ended up going to school for engineering, um, had a career doing, uh, so, you know, industrial operations, setting up factories, um, and then moved to, uh, Columbia university and got to work on some really interesting research projects for a few years where I came across carbon removal. 2008, kind of uh, Klaus Lochner's artificial trees got me totally hooked. Um, maybe it was 2009, but anyway, it was amazing um, and became obsessed. Uh, not a great time <laughs> to, to get into that, to get obsessed with carbon removal, but and then I said, okay, what am I going to do? I kind of went through direct air capture stuff, tried to see how that applied to my skill set, couldn't really see it. Um, kind of, you know, looked at some of these other, and, you know, at the time there weren't quite as many carbon removal pathways that were in the discourse, but there's a bunch and uh, got really interested in kind of felt like I could make some movement on the ocean side. This 2010, 2011, then I came home and helped run the family business, which is a commercial fishing fleet. Um, so, you know, we had 500 foot boats that we were uh, managing and um, spent a lot of time, you know, applying technology to the commercial fishing field, which was really, uh, was amazing. I got to work with some of the, you know, probably most competent people in the world. Uh, you know, people who are operating these vessels, you know, 200 miles from shore and got to learn a ton about industrial operations, applying technology in the open ocean, data management, natural resource management, sales, et cetera. Um, definitely not a tech background, but there's a lot of technology that gets applied in industrial operations. Um, and then we, you know, uh, we sold that business and I had the chance to start running Tide in 2017 um, and grabbed it. And we've been building mostly focused on quantification systems, which everyone calls MRV now. We started building them before there's MRV was a word or term. Um, so we built a lot of cool machine vision systems uh, and other sensor systems that help us understand the carbon flows in the ocean and uh, how the biological pump works. And we can identify growth of, you know, a variety of different species, really exciting stuff. Um, so how does this relate to everybody here? Um, you know, I think that, you know, I didn't really come from a tech background. Uh, I learned how to code in 2017 and made it like a mission before I started running Tide. I was like, I'm going to learn how to code Python. If I can do that, then I could start a company that has tech in it. So, you know, brute force, <laughs> listening to podcasts while I was like welding and picking fish and whatever. Um, I figured it out, but I think that that's kind of a good template for everybody. It's like, no matter what you're doing here, if you're coming from a tech background, you're going to engage in a new industry. This is all about moving mass around, you know, carbon removal is mass transfer, no matter how you do it. And that's a whole new world for like all the, you know, for all of you. And I think that's fantastic. You just have to engage with that. You're like, okay, it's a new world. I'm going to grab these skill sets. Of course, you're trying to find where you can apply your personal passion and personal skill set. But like my suggestion for everyone is like, well, one, like get into this. We need everybody because it's the biggest thing to ever happen in human history. We're going to do this. We're going to solve this problem. But 
take your personal skill set and passions but be super open to this new world that you're entering and learn from these people. Um, learn from mass movers, learn from dump truck drivers, learn from heavy equipment operators, engage in that effort because the, the opportunity is not in making another layer, right? In, in, in the value chain of carbon removal and trying to slide off a little piece of money, you know, out of that. The opportunity is in enabling these value chains to move effectively. And that that just fundamentally requires cross-disciplinary work and people, you know, operators, you know, like reaching out to technologists and working together. And, you know, you got to meet in the middle. So to me, like my best piece of advice is like, understand what the value chain is and then engage in all these different cool cross-disciplinary things, whether it's, you know, biology like living carbon or if it's just you know crushing rocks and spreading them out like engage with that operation and then you know find where you can enable that and help those people um and yeah that's the best advice i can give it's just we're all meeting we're all meeting halfway all over the place and i think the people that are able to do that and stay open minded and reach into these new industries and learn and engage like i think do really well in carbon removal um and if you try to like stay in your own little thing and like try to make something separate from all that, it doesn't seem to work out as well. So that's my advice. Uh, best of luck to everybody. Thank you so much, Marty. Um, no, the, the, the cross disciplinary nature is, is something that drew me as a former software person to carbon removal with, with so much interest. And it's, it's amazing to see it play out. Um, up next, we have Olya, who runs a company called Frost Methane, which isn't quite carbon removal in the traditional sense. Um, I'll let her share more about, about exactly what they're working on, but they're avoiding uh, natural methane emissions. Um, and Olio's background is, is particularly unique and her approach is particularly unique. Uh, so we thought it would be great to have her here just to showcase sort of like the range of climate interventions alongside carbon removal that all we're going to need uh, to make a dent in this problem. So over to you, Olya. Uh, thanks, Ryan, and uh, thanks everyone for sharing your stories. This is fascinating. Um, so I might be uh, probably the most typical uh, tech background here. I uh, was studying computer science in Canada um, when I read about a four-page article on ocean acidification that had me go from like a classical distributed systems person to like, oh shit, I guess this is the problem I'm working on for the rest of my career. Um, and the way that I approached that was like, well, what's the problem in the greater sphere of climate that is um, where I can see computer science uh, applying to the most. And a lot of people um, end up in the electric grid. If you squint at it, it looks like a graph. It looks like a classical distributed systems problem, like very comfortable to make the jump. Um, and as luck would have it, um, google.org had an engineering project at the time, which was um, kind of a really good fit. So I started over there, uh, worked on a bunch of other projects, uh, then went to Google X. Uh, to work on geothermal heating and cooling of houses and uh, long duration storage. So that was kind of my first intersection with hardware, but still in a software role, right? Like you have a lot of controls uh, to work on uh, for software systems. Like where do you place these things? Like um, lots of simulations of the market mechanism. So there's lots of software work, even if, um, even if it's a hardware project. Um, but one thing that I started doing pretty early on, maybe like two years into my climate career, was look at where emissions were coming from, um, right? So there's like pretty good, uh, there's a whole lot of good lists of that that like are, go really granular and then see how many people are solving that problem. Because my hypothesis is that my biggest impact is likely to be in the area where it's like a pretty big problem. Like it's in the ratio of how big of a problem it is divided by how many people are working on it, um, right? So instead of being in a super, super crowded space, I'm like, okay, what's the like weirdest place I can end up in? And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, non-CO2 gases came up quite a bit for me, um, right? Even, um, I think the first time I took a look at it, um, we didn't know if the oil and gas leaks were 0.5% of production or 9% of production, right? Which is just an enormous range. At 3%, um, uh, natural gas is worse than coal, right? At, at that percentage of leaks. So we have no idea. And so as, um, you know, every couple of years, I would do this kind of thing where I kept on ending up in, um, in, in this particular case, methane as being something that's um, quite underinvested. And I think in some sense, um, definitely methane out of the atmosphere is maybe where 
um, CDR was a few years ago. And what we do is we find small distributed uh, but continuous vents of methane. So for example, the permafrost has some concentrated sources uh, or semi-concentrated sources of methane, not what you would call in CDR like a point source. It's something uh, less than that, uh, but definitely not um, out of the air. And we find these, we install our devices on top of them um, and we mitigate those methane emissions. So in the simplest case, we burn it and turn it into CO2. Um, in case the strata happens to be useful to take the CO2 as well, um, so in case we're on top of um, old coal mines, right, you can, in theory, re-inject that, maybe good sequestration strata, maybe not, um, is something where we could take care of that as well. So here we are on a CDR panel producing some CO2 occasionally, um, but mitigating methane. So as I don't know if um, uh, that's a general background here, but 20% uh, of global warming is, um, you know, methane-based, uh, um, and each molecule over 100 years captures 28 times more um, more heat than, um, than CO2. And this is kind of including the half-life in the atmosphere. So this is why turning it into CO2 can be beneficial. And in small distributed sources, sometimes that's the best you can do. And sometimes depending on strata you sit on top of, um, you can do other things. So as far as um, how to get into the space in general, I would say uh, what I did for the first couple of years is I went to like every meetup and every climate event possible. And at the time, this is like 10 years ago, there was way, way fewer of these around. Now, like definitely every major city has like three things a week. There's some great newsletters that like aggregate all of these events. So just like go and interact with people that work in the industry. Um, the second thing I'd say is now there's also like all of these online Slack communities, which are great. Um, I do office hours once a week with work on climate. So you can just go on the work on climate page, click on experts and just like book time with me and many, many other people. So you can kind of have that chat directly, um, especially if you're a software engineer. I feel like that's where I have, or, or interested in my thing. That's where I kind of have the most to contribute. And, um, you know, it's like a really exciting space. There's just so much to do, right? CDRs in its infancy, all the methane stuff with the exception of like landfills and oil and gas, all of that is also in its infancy. So there's just really uh, quite a few things you can do. And if you have a business development background, we've got a couple of open positions on that side. Thanks so much, Olya. Um, when Olya and I first met, she showed me a picture of her team roasting marshmallows over a methane flare <laughs> at like a lake in the permafrost. And it is extremely <laughs> cool. Um, so even former software engineers can uh, burn methane on random Arctic lakes. Who would have thought? <laughs> um, thanks, Olya. Um, up next, uh, Brad Hartwig, who's the uh, CEO of Arbor. Awesome. Thanks, Ryan. Everyone, I'm Brad Hartwig, founder and CEO of Arbor. Um, yeah, really quick. I'm you know, very fortunate to work both with Ryan and Joanna. They are truly incredible. Um, also just wanted to say it's so cool to hear from the other panelists. I think a common you know, theme here is that there's such a variety of solutions out there and we need absolutely all of them working at massive scale to stay under 1.5 degrees C. Uh, and so, yeah, there are just so many opportunities and a lot of them we're still figuring out on a you know daily basis. Um, my background, uh, maybe again, uh, less conventional. Um, I actually started out in aerospace engineering. I spent my early career working at SpaceX, developing rocket engines for their Crew Dragon vehicle to ferry NASA astronauts to and from the International Space Station. Um, and I actually, I don't know if I uh, ever told Ryan or Joanna this, but I actually aspired to be an astronaut for a period of years. Um, I became a, a test pilot became a specialist in search and rescue operations, um, actually went back to grad school. But the, the more I started to go down that path, the more I, I struggled with the fact that the health of this planet was rapidly declining. And so I took the hard pivot to ditch the astronaut pathway and start a carbon removal company instead to focus on Earth. Um, at Arbor, we are developing a new system for carbon negative bioenergy. I like to describe it as a vegetarian rocket engine to save the planet rather than to leave it. Um, and so basically we can feed organic waste streams and oxygen into uh, this engine and generate 
clean power, uh, fresh water, and permanently remove CO2 from the atmosphere in the process. Um, and to me, that just seems like totally like magic. Um, but we're we're imagining a, a solar punk future where carbon negative power is is at the center of a global circular economy. And I think that is something we could achieve in, in our lifetime with enough resources. And so I think it's actually a, a huge antidote or antidote to a lot of the you know climate anxiety that is out there is we you know, with this nascent industry, we have a chance to to do something really incredible. Um, that's you know something we're taking very seriously at at Arbor. Um, I think for our technology specifically, a a really powerful way to envision uh, you know how this system works is by taking a look at something called a Keeling curve. Uh, it's K E E L I N G. Um, obviously, if you're on this call, you probably know that CO2 levels in the atmosphere are increasing year over year, uh, but you might not know that over a given year, those levels actually fluctuate up and down by over seven parts per million. And, and what that is, is, is literally the earth breathing. And, and that's plants drawing down CO2 from May to October. And then from October to May, those, those plants die and they decay and they release that carbon back in the atmosphere. And at Arbor, what we're doing is we're, we're basically turbocharging that natural rhythm by taking waste plant matter. So think of like forestry waste, agricultural waste, residential waste, and feeding that into our engine. And at that point, through a staged oxy combustion process, we release the chemical energy but we, we hold on to the CO2 and we then store that permanently underground in geologic formation. And at scale with, with some unique systems integration, uh, our, most, our most recent assessments are that this approach could actually remove up to 20 gigatons of CO2 fear per year. Um, and at a price point of what we're talking, you know, eventually $50 or less. So I think to, to put that in scale or put that, I guess, give some context to that, that's, it's less than 1% of, of global GDP. So you can kind of think of it like a 1% tax on humanity to ultimately ensure its survival long-term. And, and I think that's a very you know, good use of 1% of, of, of Earth's GDP. Um, but uh, I, I guess, um, what I think on the whole, whether people realize it or not, is that civilization is starting to shift more towards this astronaut mindset. And what that means is treating our resources as precious and our actions as, as truly consequential. And that's, that's what we're doing at Arbor. Um, and I, th I think just to lean a little bit more into the, the space analogies, I think um, I like to think of Earth as, as a, a spaceship, it's, um, it, it really is a, a rock hurtling through space around the sun. Um, and on a spaceship, uh, one of the core systems is referred to as ECLIS. It's the uh, Environmental Control and Life Support System. And that system is literally responsible for scrubbing CO2 from the cabin of the spacecraft, providing thermal management to maintain livable temperatures and filter out pollutants. And I see carbon removal as really our way of maintaining Earth's life support system. We're currently at about uh, 100 to 120 parts per million over where we should be right now. Um, typical levels fluctuate from around 180 ppm to 280 uh, ppm. The impact of what is essentially a trace gas in the atmosphere is truly I think astounding when you look at it, if you were to remove CO2 from the atmosphere altogether, go from you know, 180 parts per million to zero, the planet would be around 30 degrees Celsius colder than it is today. Our oceans would freeze and all life on, on earth would, would disappear. Um, we're now dealing with 100, 120 parts per million over the typical range. And as we, that continues to grow, you know, you're at risk of throwing global weather systems completely out of balance and into chaos. And so 
I just think that's, you know, it's extremely important to understand that carbon removal is absolutely necessary as the, essentially the backbone of, of Earth's now life support system. Um, and I think how I see tech fitting into this is, I, I think really the great part is that you get to decide, um, you know, at core, tech is about solving problems. None of our team had, uh, you know, experience with carbon removal before working at Arbor. This is like truly, truly, truly a brand new industry and we need all hands on deck. Um, and I think as others have mentioned, this is absolutely the most exciting time to get involved. Um, it's it's assessed, assessed that the majority of carbon removal will actually take place in the, the second half of the century, but the majority of the innovation will happen in this coming decade. And so we need massive scale data reduction for geospatial analyses, we need robotics, harvesting and processing waste biomass. We need building out the network uh, you know, infrastructure for remotely operating and, and monitoring complex systems. We need building out data pipelines for managing project manifest, hardware and biomass tracking, maintenance schedules. Uh, there's so, so much. And I think my suggestion kind of a, you know, look, reflecting on, on my personal journey one of the best ways to get into this space is truly just becoming a student of the problem of the carbon removal ecosystem at large and the potential solutions. Um, for me, it was just reading everything I could get my hands on, uh, reaching out to folks in the industry and picking their brains and really starting to think hard you know, for everyone here about where you want to plug in. Um, there's so many ways to contribute to solving the carbon problem, and I guarantee that many of you on this call right now are going to find entirely new ways. Um, let you know applying rocket engine technology to carbon removal hopefully be uh, just one example of that. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is just uh, how collaborative this space is, which is something I really uh, think is you know for me gives me so much hope about you know this industry and our be able our ability to overcome this problem is that um, we're we need everything to work we need all solutions you know scaling massively and everyone has the same goal and if you know any of us are successful we're all successful and that's a I think it's a very rare opportunity to essentially get to be a, a superhero uh, working to save the planet and, you know, for me personally, when I have kids and, and they're all grown up, I want to be able to say that, you know, I gave every last ounce of effort doing everything I could to, you know, preserve this planet and, and its inhabitants for, for all future generations. Um, so, yeah, with that, uh, I'll pass it back over to our panelists or to Ryan. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. Um, we are, well, we're disappointed you're uh, not an astronaut. We're also personally thrilled that you are in, in, in this space and uh, doing what you're doing with Arbor. Um, awesome. Okay, so we got a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so we're going to just tick through a couple. Maybe the one to start um, about a lot of upvotes is people asking about the business model of CDR. So we're at an early stage in the market. Is this government contracts? Is this grant funding? I think probably have different perspectives on this call, but maybe a few folks can talk about how they think about the business model today and what they think that will be um, in the out years or as we get to 2030, 2040. They want to kick us off. Laura? Sure. I'm happy to talk a little bit about Travertine's approach. Um, we co produce a number of products in our process that are already used at very large scales in um, industrial processes. And so by doing that, we hope to essentially um, allow us to kind of minimize our business risk over the short term such that we can be in a good position in the longer term to um, rely on a more um, stable market that's hopefully led by compliance markets and, and governments uh, in the end and in carbon dioxide removal and sequestration. And this is in part because our process is, um, it would be too expensive to, to only produce uh, carbon dioxide removal and permanent sequestration uh, at this point, um, given the efficiencies of our process. And so um, I think I think this is a really important question for navigating, especially engineering solutions when you have very capital intensive um, uh, systems where you have to finance 
uh, the build of that capital. And to do that, you have to demonstrate that you essentially have stable markets to sell your products into it. So I think this is a, it's a really, really critical question. And it's a, um, a question that every company is gonna have to navigate in its own way. Um, but I will say that the work of, of Stripe Frontier, um, Lower Carbon, just creating um, uh, financial stability, uh, the ability for companies to actually sell credits and have a product that we can sell and have top line revenue, right? <laughs> Uh, we have top line revenue um, they can't recognize until we uh, build our plant, right? And so that's a, a really amazingly privileged position to be in as a, as a founder. Um, and uh, we look forward to those markets growing. Um, and I think at the end of the day, though, um, in future, uh, I think we really need governments to uh, be essentially pricing uh, the environmental impacts of, of the waste carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere because uh, most other uh, hazardous wastes are... Um, regulated in the sense that uh, companies have to pay a certain price to basically uh, eliminate the waste stream or manage it, right? And so that, that's not how we're doing CDR right now or carbon carbon markets right now, but I hopefully uh, in the future, that's, that'll evolve. Awesome, yeah, I would echo that, that we think, you know, obviously there's a huge role today for the voluntary carbon market to play um, and paying for expensive first times. But hopefully, long term, we have a market that carbon removal can be your one and only and primary revenue source. And that probably will rely a lot on having big government um, support uh, in terms of incentives, uh, tax policy, but also hopefully procurement as well in the long run. Um, maybe the next question from, from Zach is, what's the biggest, sorry, this is my voice, what's the biggest choke point um, to large scale carbon removal right now? So. Um, Maybe Olya, we can start with you and go to Brad. But what is it? You know, capture, storage, incentives, investment. What do you guys see right now as kind of the biggest barrier in in scaling? Um, so for us, there are two things, right? One is definitely data on the natural sources, and there's um, there is a question in the chat right now about that. Um, that is uh, for human sources, we have reasonably good data sets. For some of these like small distributed ones, they're below what um, the methane satellites uh, can detect right now. So there's like visual proxies that are um, kind of interesting. And the other one is the and like at the end of the day, when we do a project, right, because we have to do it at a very specific place, even if it's in the middle of the Arctic, you always have landowners and mineral rights owners and lots of permitting and that sort of stuff that you need to do. So there's actually um, very non-trivial and reasonably long uh, contracting processes, which would be a lot shorter if there was kind of more money to hand out to the land and the mineral rights owners. So there's kind of the stretch where, um, you know, we're going for like, you know, very cheap offsets, but as a result of that, um, you know, what you can offer to the people that you're impacting with your project is, is less. So that's the kind of um, line that we're, that we're rocking these days. Yeah, I think from Arbor's side, these are very complex systems at, you know, infrastructure scale, and they're using technologies that in many cases have not been demonstrated, at least not at the scale that is you know, required. And so what we're navigating is one, how do you move as fast as possible? And for us, that often looks like parallel pathing both your technology development and your project development, which is always an exciting problem when you're uh, looking to uh, you know, get a system on the ground, but there's still unknown questions or you're still looking to answer uh, certain things, whether at you know, lab scale or, or pilot scale. Um, and, and also you know, financing a project of that scale when you fall into this kind of weird space of you're not, this isn't typical, like a typical project where you have 80% project finance, 20% equity finance. It's like, this is a first of a kind system. And and people want to see a bit more skin in the game. And so you have to raise, you know, more equity finance usually. And I think the government is starting to step in and, and bring a lot of, you know, basically, you know, money to the table, especially with the passing of the recent Inflation Reduction Act. And so uh, it's, you're building the technology, you're, you're having to develop the machine to build the machine, which is basically an organization in a, in a market that is rapidly forming around us. And then you have to network with tons of folks across different industries at both the state and federal level, 
so that you can, you know, hopefully get some of the, you know, the, the money that the um, government is trying to allocate into deployment of these new technologies. And then you're also working at the local and community level to ensure that these projects are uh, going to be accepted by the community and hopefully be an add to their community. So looking to these other co-benefits of what your solution can offer, um, whether that's, you know, for us, carbon negative power, or fresh water, reducing wildfire risk in the local community. Um, and every solution will have its different co-benefits. But, you know, developing your pitch and, and working with the community on how, how you can truly, truly be, you know, a, a um, value add. To, to the community you're, you're operating in. Marty, I know this is something that's also really important to, to Running Tide and your approach. Did you have anything that you wanted to add on that one? Uh, sorry, repeat the question. I just thinking about, you know, Brad talking about co-benefits and some of the ways in which uh, looking at co-revenue streams or impact around. Yeah. And I know just the way that you guys have engaged in terms of job and employment. Um, yeah. Be that. Okay. yeah, so I mean, that's to me the one of the most exciting things about climate uh, carbon removal is the that these are going to be you know big supply chain problems. They're going to engage a whole bunch of people who haven't been involved in you know maybe the growth over the past forty years. Uh, a lot of the communities are going to you know what we're turning on you know with running tide is uh, you know communities that have suffered from you know the drop in. Uh, mining activity or the drop in forestry activity or waterfronts that have seen a drop in activity due to like, you know, commercial fishing going away and some of the other activities. So it's really exciting that um, we're going to be building systems that like engage these communities and start to provide um, jobs and turn back on kind of the rust belt a little bit. I think that's really exciting. Um, you know, in terms of our specific interventions, uh, the scariest thing in the world to me is ocean acidification. Like, um, if you're scared about warming, yeah, I'm with you also, but like, I'm just personally terrified of ocean acidification. So, um, you know, there's a bunch, because uh, I've seen what it can do, like firsthand, I've just watched what acidification can do in the ocean environment and how it hurts, you know, basically all biodiversity and ecosystems. Um, and uh, so something that we really work on at Running Tide is, okay, how do our systems affect the totality of the ecosystem. How do we account for that? What externalities can we bring inside of our system? Carbon removal in general is bringing an externality inside the financial system, the carbon emissions. But like, what are the other things that we can also bring inside the financial system, account for, and then present to our uh, potential partners or customers as like what we call co-benefits? So um, you know, it, it could be nitrogen abatement, ocean acidification, it could be biodiversity enhancement through uh, restoration of ecosystems, et cetera. But all of those things are, um, you know, really key things to track and are part of our MRV strategy. So our MRV strategy is what are all the negatives and positives that are associated with our activity, including jobs, including where those jobs are, including how much they pay and our, the communities want those types of jobs. Um, and then also what are the ancillary uh, ecosystem benefits that you can generate. Um, you know, the, and then also just the tools, techniques, and infrastructures that we build up to do this at large scale are also applicable for other things. Like, you know, if you get really good, really, really good at producing kelp spores uh, to do carbon removal. You can use that to make biofuels. You can use that to restore coastal ecosystems. It's, um, you could use that to feed cows, you know, uh, stuff that reduces their, uh, you know, there's so many, um, you know, degrees of freedom inside of at least what we're working on. And I think a lot of these other technologies as well. Um, so yeah, stuff we think about, and it's really important. And like, just the accounting for all that is actually a great opportunity for people who are great at um, collating and crunching through data. Um, that's like a great opportunity for people maybe on the call. It's just like understanding the, those next level effects of whatever intervention we're all working on. Maybe pulling on that thread a little bit, we got a couple questions in the chat around how, like, how do you break into the space? Um, it's one from Jen around, you know, has your company embraced a like hire for capability versus specific expertise in, in uh, like a subspecialty of CDR? How do you guys think about that? And how would you think about if I'm someone interested in getting into this space, 
what's a good kind of entry point or way to position myself to carbon removal startups or folks in the industry? Uh, I mean, I'll take a quick one and then leave room for everyone else. But to me, it's just, um, you know, learn the basics. You got to learn the basics about the industry and what it, what it means and kind of understand the very basics. So at least we know that like, okay, you've put some effort in. Um, but se second, it's like the expectations are pretty low for people to be subject matter experts. You have to go really deep on this stuff. It takes years to like get all the way, or at least for me, maybe I'm not as smart as some of these people, but it takes years to understand all the nuances all, of all this. So it's not something we set as an expectation, like this person better be able to speak to like the nuances of like, in our company, like air sea flux. Like I don't, I'm not asking anybody for that. Well, unless you're specifically to work on air sea flux, but um <laughs> But like generally what we're, our expectation is that you've engaged with the effort broadly and you're, and you're curious, you're bringing some skill sets in your backpack, but mostly you're just open-minded and like in, in excited to learn from all the other people. So I'd say just position yourself as like learn the basics and then just be open-minded and excited and bring something with you, bring something in your backpack of skills that we need, you know, so. And I would add to that, that's true for founders also, like for anyone who's considering starting something like, you know. In some cases, you're like Laura and you've studied this stuff for many years professionally, but in a lot of cases, you're someone who, you know, you, you may have heard from, from Peter at Charm or Maddie at Living Carbon earlier this week, you know, neither of whom have an academic background in this area and are both running great companies. And it really is something that the community is really supportive and you actually like can go learn and figure out, uh, even if you haven't been studying it for years. And to some extent, it's like a question of the stage of the company, right? Like at some point, um, you know, there's only so many people that you need in the company that have 10 years of carbon market experiences, right? So in our case, um, that was, you know, we're looking for a certain skill set, but if I need, you know, if we need a mechanical engineer, whether they have any experience in um, carbon markets or not, or like the, what they did previously is um, to me, reasonably irrelevant. Like I care that they they are aligned with the mission. I care, um, as Marty was saying, that they have that people have a skill to bring. But post that, um, actually not at all. And like we've been making an effort to hire people in the areas where we work, which typically don't have these skill sets, and that's completely fine, right? Um, so I I think in our case, um, you know, I feel that. I had a little bit of background coming in, and so I don't necessarily need to hire for that background. If I had a little bit less of a background, I would need to um, hire more for that. But um, yeah, it's just uh, 10 years of experience in carbon markets has never been what we looked for uh, in anybody we hired. <laughs> awesome. Okay, I know we're at basically at time. I'm gonna do one more really big rapid fire. While we you know, selfishly hope most folks are excited to work in this space, we think it's a pretty energizing time and, and a big need. We know that realistically not everyone will. And so if folks aren't in the space but want to support the carbon removal industry and founders and momentum from afar, maybe like a quick word uh, from a couple of folks on how could they do that? Your lightning round answer. Um, Brad. I think uh, one socializing that this is something that we really need first and foremost. Everyone has talked about global, de you know, decarbonization of the global economy, but carbon removal has increasingly become an absolute necessity. And so, yeah, I think just socializing it. Laura, uh, buy some credits. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Marty. Uh lobby politicians and bureaucrats to remove barriers to projects. Oh, and Alia closes out. Um, I think I'm with Laura on this one, right? And I think like, look at projects you like and pre-purchase some credits. Um, and I think that gives, uh, that gives everybody, having a little bit of that money gives you a chance to make bigger, faster bets. Awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for, for, for hosting this, this whole week worth of events and for having us. Uh, thanks, Joanna, and to uh, all the founders who joined today. And uh, thanks to everyone in the audience for their great questions. Uh, Jonathan's put details on everyone in the chat. Uh, you can follow up with everyone uh, from the Climate Draft website and uh, hope to get to meet a lot of you soon working on carbon removal. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.